immediately, uh, both doors open simultaneously. And all of a sudden I see the foot and leg of a guy coming out and the barrel of a rifle coming up in my direction. Hey gang, I was at my local gun shop picking up a little EDC, a little micro nine millimeter the other day. And I had a glimpse at the ammo prices and it's nuts how expensive ammunition is these days. That's why Mantis Firearms Training System is a longtime sponsor of Active Self Protection. We're so grateful for them and for their product. Getting immediate measurable visual feedback, it takes so much time out of the learning curve of dry fire. And this product is worth every penny. It's so inexpensive for what you get. In our opinion, what gets measured gets improved. And this helps you measure every aspect of dry and live fire. Visit them at mantis.com and let them know you heard about them on the Ask Podcast. All right, heads up, gang. This week's show is part one of two. Part two will be out next week. Part one is the introduction story about the shooting in Garland, Texas, where they held a art contest, and some members of ISIS showed up to try to shoot the place up. And our man uh, in this episode was the one to prevent that from happening. Enjoy the show, and come back next week for the rest of it. All right, gang, welcome back to the Active Self-Protection Podcast. I am your host, as always, Mike Williver, your favorite former Fed. With us today, I'm pleased to have uh, Greg Stevens. Greg is retired from the Garland, Texas Police Department. He is uh, married with one son, still lives in the great state of Texas. And there's a very good chance this is going to be a two-part episode. So if this ends abruptly, folks, you know it's the next. the rest of it's coming next week. But we'll see how that plays out. Greg, thanks so much for being here, sir. How are you? Mike, it's great to be here, man. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. I'm I'm honored to be a part of this. So I think a lot of folks who listen to this show are probably familiar with the event. It happened back in May of 2015 in Garland, Texas. There was an event held at a community center. Uh, The event was in response to some uh, stuff that was going on in Europe, uh, Paris, and the Netherlands, where there had been some Islamic extremists who were upset about the depictions of Muhammad that were released in various uh, publications and had committed some acts of terror so a group in texas decided to hold a basically a draw muhammad contest for lack of a better way to put it uh and it turns out uh no big shock that drew out some rather unsavory characters and we'll get into that later on um but greg is the the officer uh who was there that day and probably saved a lot of lives and we uh, we thank him for that and for his service so Greg, walk us through your childhood. Did you grow up in Texas, and did you grow up around guns your whole life? Well, actually, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, I was actually born in Canada. <laughs> um, but came to came to Texas when I was about six, almost seven years old, and and grew up here in Texas. And uh, so I'm I'm really a Texan um, through and through. To be honest with you, um, I love being here. I love the state of Texas, and and what it stands for and the values that we enjoy here. And, and, uh, I, you know, I just love being, a uh, a part of this culture here. Um, I did, you know, <clears throat> my family, uh, I was the youngest boy. I was the youngest of three and the only boy. So it didn't take me long to figure out what kind of a coveted position in the family that was. Mm-hmm. I took complete and total advantage of that every chance I got. And I have two older sisters that, that still mother me as much as they can. And, uh, and I had a great childhood, man. My mom and dad were married forever and today. Both are gone now, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, uh, a lot of leave it to beaver kind of childhood for me. Uh, and, um, and it, you know, I don't take that for granted because rarely do I get to meet people anymore that can say they had that kind of a childhood. Right. And uh, so what a blessing it was for me. And, and, uh, and I, I find that to be, important in my development of my own values and those kinds of things. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't, you know, nowadays they're learning it from TV, from the internet, from all kinds of terrible places, not getting it at home near like they should, I think. So, hmm. um, that's, that's a whole nother podcast. But... <laughs> right. <laughs> so growing up, did you got, did your family have guns in the house and were, if, if so, were you aware of them or were they hidden away, locked in a safe or how'd that work? You know, no, we didn't really have guns in the house. Um, interesting, um, when I was, oh gosh, I was just in my early teens, I guess. We had some friends that owned a large piece of property outside of Austin and uh, family friends. And they had two sons, uh, both of them, one of them was about a year and a half older than me and the other one was a couple of three years older than me. 
but I used to go out there and spend time on this, on this ranch. It was a working ranch. And, uh, and that's where I really got into it, you know, shooting and just outdoorsy kind of things. We were kind of city folks, you know, I grew, grew up in town. Um, I liked sports, but, uh, never really did a lot of hunting or anything. And when I would go out, uh, and, and stay on the ranch and it, and it wasn't unusual for me to spend a couple of three weeks at a time out there. Um, we would go out, I, I had a, I bought, I say I bought, my dad had to buy it for me, obviously, because I was young, but, um, I bought a little 22 rifle, a little, um, Winchester's 270 deluxe pump, hmm. which I just gave to my son a couple of years ago, uh, cause I still have it. And that's kind of a collectible gun at this point. And I uh, also had a little, uh, Savage Stevens 20 gauge shotgun, single action or, or single shot shotgun. And I, and goodness gracious, 22 bullets were next to nothing way back then. And, and we, me and this, the younger of the two boys, we spent a lot of time out and shooting and plinking and did a little bird hunting and that kind of stuff. And, and that's, that's how I, you know, that was my first exposure really to firearms. Didn't do a whole lot of pistol stuff. I didn't know anything about pistols till later in life, but. Yeah, that's a pretty common theme. Um, among people, uh, my, my generation and older, uh, you, you see there's a, you know, maybe there's a rifle or shotgun in the house, but it's just, uh, um, pistols, a whole different, a whole different ball of wax, I, I guess. So tell me, Greg, what year did you start in law enforcement? Did you, did you start with Garland PD or somewhere else? No, I, well, <clears throat> technically, I guess I started somewhere else. I went to school at Texas state university and, uh, used to be called Southwest Texas state university. And then I, left there and they had to change the name, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, it's called Texas state university now. And I actually worked as a dispatcher for the, uh, for the college there for a little while, while I was going to school, I'd worked from midnight until seven in the morning and then go to school and commuted back and forth to Austin, which is about 30 miles, um, which would pretty much kill me now. I think, uh, I guess when you're 20, you can do just about anything for a while. Yep. Um, but anyway, that was actually my first real involvement in law enforcement. But I was I was studying criminal justice because I knew I had a, a you know obviously I had an interest in it. And then uh, then when I when I left school, I did go to work for the Garland Police Department. I started the police academy in uh, uh, May of 1978, about six days after my 23rd birthday. Was it a very competitive environment at that point? That's that's about 10 years before my time. Yeah, when I started, I like to ask this because when I started, it was incredibly competitive to get into law enforcement. There was hundreds of applicants for each opening. Was it like that when you started, or, or not so much? Oh, it was very much like that. Um, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, it, a, a little uh, acknowledgement of naivety on my part. Um, Garland Police Department was going to hire. They they had fifteen positions they wanted to fill. Garland was just in the beginnings of a, of a really big growth spurt. And, uh, but they wanted to hire 15 officers. And so, uh, <clears throat> I, I was, uh, signed up and went to take the civil service exam, drove from Austin up to Garland and uh, showed up and I walk in the door and there's about 350 people sitting there to take the civil service exam for 15 spots. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that might've been a 200 mile drive for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, I sat down and I took the test and what, how they decided on who they were going to proceed with was based on when you had to pass the test. And then they ranked you according to where you, your score on the test and, and, and they ranked you numerically from highest to lowest. And, uh, I'm not trying to brag on myself, but heck, I was 22nd on the list. So uh, hey, not bad. that was a big, that, that's a victory <laughs> right there, yeah. no matter what happens. But I was a little disappointed that I was 22nd because I thought, oh, they're only hiring 15 people. So right. I guess I'm probably not going to get there. I had no idea that it would take 100 applicants to maybe get 10, you know. Right. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, I went through the hiring process, which was quite lengthy. Um as you know, and um, ultimately got appointed to the uh, uh, police academy um, there in Garland. We had our own academy. Ours was actually the first academy that they did solely on their own. They had used a regional academy and then supplemented that with a local academy as well. But 
ours was the first one we did the entirety of the academy um, in house. So going back to the hiring process, I'm curious because because uh, you started earlier than I think anyone else I've had on the show thus far. Uh, earlier year, that, I should say. Wait a minute, that makes me sound pretty dang old. <laughs> <laughs> no, didn't didn't mean it that way for sure. Uh, I'm just kidding. So you said late seventies. What was the rest of the hiring process like? I'm just curious to know. Was there a physical agility? Was there a, a polygraph or anything else like that back then? There was all of that. Okay. Um, I, the first thing was the civil service exam. After you completed that, they would continue in the hiring process. They actually, they some guys from Garland PD came down to San Marcos, where the school, where I went to school, um, and there were three of us that they uh, screened. That we did the physical agility test, the preliminary interview, and a polygraph exam there in San Marcos to save us having to all come back up there. Um, so once we got through that part. Then they, and we filled out our personal history form that was 35 pages or some crazy amount. Mm. Um, then we, uh, then they started our background investigation and that took some time. And once they completed that, we were invited to an, a, a, a oral interview board. And uh, once you went to your oral interview board, provided that all went very well, then they would send you for a medical physical to make sure that there wasn't anything medically wrong with you. And um, all having all that done, then they then you were appointed to a spot in the police academy. How long was the academy, and how do you feel the quality of the training was back in the late 70s? Uh, well, um, our academy was, I believe it was, I can't remember for sure. I think it was, I, I was thinking it was in the vicinity of 18 weeks. 16 or 18 weeks, I think is what it was. The, uh, the, the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement um, has a minimum requirement and so on, and that was well in excess of that. Um, and our, our academy was really kind of modeled after the Texas Department of Public Safety, the state police here in Texas, kind of after their academy. It's very military, very regimented, um, lots and lots and lots of PT. I think they were trying to kill us, to be honest with you. But, right. Um, I remember, but uh, it was tough. It was it was tough. It, it was not for the faint of heart, to say the least. So you would compare it to uh, paramilitary, like a boot camp type thing. A, lo a lot of yelling. Anybody actually hit you? Because I know before my time, there was that was a thing that happened in the academy. The instructor could lay hands on you if, if if he felt it was necessary. No, that never happened in our academy. I never saw that happen. Um, but we had some guys. Um, I'm telling you that we're skilled at the uh, proverbial butt chewing. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, they could, they could do it with, with great zeal and, uh, and make a believer out of you in a hurry. I can promise you that. And we're all 20 something year old kids that think we know a lot about the world, but in all reality, we're so naive. It's not even funny. One of the PDs I worked for back East was, uh, at the beach and we had white uniform shirts and my academy instructor would constantly run, ask me, run up and ask me, um, was I going to get jelly donut stains on his white uniform shirt? <laughs> I assured him, <laughs> I assured him that would not, not ever happen. So after the academy, I, I assume you guys have qualifications like every other department and follow on training. Uh, how was your firearms training and how did it, let me ask you this. How did your firearms training develop over time? Because you were on for a long time. So you went from revolvers to semi-autos, probably maybe different shooting positions. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. The first year um, that I was uh, uh, on the department here in Garland, I was, uh, I was required to carry a revolver. I wasn't even, the option of carrying a semi-automatic wasn't even available to me as a new recruit and, and as a uh, probationary officer. So uh, my first uh, duty weapon was a Colt Trooper Mark III 357 Magnum, which was about as big as me. Mm. Um, I'm not a big guy, but um, but anyway, uh, I, and you know, I wish I still had that gun. I, I traded it for a Colt 1911, <laughs> but I really wish I'd have kept it and just bought a Colt 1911 at this right. point. But, um, <clears throat> but the, that's the beauty of youth, I guess. And uh, but anyway, the firearms training we got was... Um, was okay 
Um, uh, but I'll be real honest with you as time wore on, um, the, the, the guys that were the range masters and so on, as they, those positions got filled by different people, um, due to retirements and, and whatever, mm-hmm. um, the quality of our training continued to go up and up and up. And I'll be honest with you, especially the last probably 15, nearly 20 years of my career, I was really privileged to have some good quality, super quality firearms instruction by some really top notch guys. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, when I started in the early nineties, uh, my first firearm was a Smith and Wesson model 65 revolver 357. And at that point, every crook that I was coming up against had a, you know, usually the early Glock model 17s were really popular and they were just make such fun of my little quote, quote unquote pea shooter that I had. I don't know if they understood what a 357 round was or could do, but they seemed to think it wasn't, it was insufficient. Uh, with that said, let's let's talk about the um, the incident in question here. And I've I've said this to more than one person. I don't think anyone's life or career should be um, characterized by one incident. But this was a pretty significant incident. It made national news. Uh, and again, it happened May twenty third of twenty fifteen. And as I said in the opening, this was a response by some folks here in the states. And we don't delve into politics here, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to debate whether it was a right or wrong thing to do or, or anything like that. That's really irrelevant because what happened was some people came to attack innocent people who were doing them no harm and something had to be done about it. With that said, uh, following a spate of terrorist incidents in Europe uh, over people drawing images of the Prophet Muhammad and the, the religion of Islam, uh, they had a contest to draw Muhammad. And I think I, I think the point of that in my in my opinion was to say you know you know um hey no disrespect but you can't tell another person what they can and can't do what they can and can't draw or can and can't say uh because because it offends you or your sensibilities so with that said uh two two suspects who we will not name here i hope uh, i don't like giving them uh, any any press or credit uh approached this event and decided they were going to bring some body armor and some weapons and start killing innocent people. And you happen to be, I think you're one of the first people they encountered. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, that is correct. But let me, let me back you up a little bit. Sure. Let me tell you a little bit about how we got there. Let's uh, let's, let's start with that. Absolutely. So, um, so in February, I believe it was February of that same year of of 2015, there was an event held at the Curtis Cowell Center, which is a, a publicly owned building. The school district owns the building. It was built on a bond on bond funds, I believe. And it's a great facility. It's like a big basketball arena kind of thing that holds about 10,000 or so, eight to 10,000. And it's got a conference center off of it too. And it's a beautiful building. And this event, the Draw the Profit Art Contest, um, was uh, held in the conference center. But prior to that, like in February, there was a meeting held there um, by another organization that's a Muslim-based organization here in the North Texas area called Sound Vision. And uh, as it turns out, this meeting uh, featured a couple of guest speakers that had some rather jihadist kind of um, rhetoric on the internet that you could find. I I don't know that you can find it now, Mm -hmm. but you could back then apparently. And, uh, and so somehow the folks in Garland, Texas found out about this meeting. Now these, the sound vision organization had used the facility in the past and uh, held meetings there and so on with no controversy at all. But this particular one, because of the guest speakers, um, apparently raised some great ire on the part of the citizens of Garland. Now, let me take a second here and tell you, Garland is a, is a pretty large city with, a, I think, the 13th or the 14th largest city in the state of Texas, although we're a suburb of Dallas and we border Dallas and many other cities. But we're probably in the 265,000 population range, so this isn't a small place, it's mm-hmm. a big place. But it's a rather blue-collar kind of a community. It's not... It's not a brand new, it's, we've been around a while, it's not brand new. Um, 
And goodness gracious, Garland, um, what a privilege it was to serve those folks for 40 years. Um, they're just a bunch of, um, you know, family oriented, um, faithful, um, patriotic, great Americans. And, um, uh, and they, you know, Garland is a rather conservative place and they hold rather conservative values and so on. So somehow when they found out that this meeting was going to take place with these two rather controversial individuals, and you got to remember in 2015, ISIS was at its kind of pinnacle mm -hmm. of strength, um, over in the Middle East and were working magic recruiting people here in the United States. I'm not sure how they got that done, but they were, they were darn good at it. Yeah, they were. And uh, so that particular event drew a lot of attention, and we actually had protests at that event. There was about a 1,000 prote protesters showed up, some on either side, and luckily it was not anything violent that occurred, but um, there was certainly uh, lots of interest. Hmm. And that, <clears throat> um, that was kind of a big deal. We don't have too much of that going on here in Garland, right? So... Uh, Moving forward, the Draw the Profit Art Contest that actually was May 3rd, 2015, that was put on by a promoter out of New York named Pamela Geller. And I think Pamela Geller picked Garland, Texas to do this because of the previous event, okay. because of the controversy that was already there. And she was trying to make her point was that, you know, we, uh, she's an ardent believer in freedom of speech, not just here in this country, but globally. And she was, her thought was that, you know, these attacks on these cartoonists was a, uh, an attack on everybody's freedom of speech and expression and so on. And she wanted to make a point that we weren't going to kowtow to their violent intimidation and so forth. Right. So that's how we ended up at this event on May 3rd, um, 2015 and Pamela Geller uh, to off to make sure there was interest in it. They offered a $10,000 prize for the winning submission. And uh, they also had a people's choice award for another 2,500 bucks. So, you know, needless to say, there were people that were, you know, definitely uh, interested because there was a pretty significant financial reward for, for the thing too. Right. But in any case, so, um, <clears throat> We, we were notified about this event um, before, long before it actually happened. Now, I wasn't. And there's kind of a funny story about how I got there. We'll get to that in a minute. But, mm -hmm. but the, the department knew that there was a great deal of potential for uh, more protests and all kinds of security issues and so on. So <clears throat> one of our our SWAT lieutenants put together the safety plan that we ultimately implemented for this thing. And, and, uh, and I was just a part of, of, of that particular safety plan. And, uh, so, uh, let me tell you how I got there. This is kind of almost comical. So I was in the traffic unit, um, for, the last 33 years of my career. Okay. Right. And, I, Spent nearly 28 of it on motorcycles, and then I worked in an unmarked traffic car. And and we had we always had a lot of overtime available in our unit, just because there was always special events or stuff that we we could do. So <clears throat> typically, uh, because I had so much overtime and stuff available, I rarely went into the patrol squad room where they would post their overtime available stuff. But I would go through there every once in a while, just kind of out of curiosity to see what was going on. And, and I saw this event, this Draw the Profit art contest, or, and I don't remember if I even read that. All I saw was a deal for working at the Curtis Cowell Center on a Sunday afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. And there was one spot open. And I checked on it for a couple of weeks. I would walk by there, and that one spot was open. One spot was open. Finally, it was getting pretty close to the time of the event. I thought, well, if nobody else wants it, I'll work that. It's so what I signed up for was five hours of easy overtime on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Uh-huh. Not, not exactly what I ended up with, but, um, but that's how I ended up there. I had no idea what the event was until the first briefing that I was called to for this event, which was kind of unusual to be called to a briefing for one of these things. 
And then they're talking about this draw the profit art contest. And I'm fine. I have to nudge the guy next to me and say, what they, what is this? What are they talking about? I had no idea what I had signed up for. Right. So anyway, um, but you, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it garnered plenty of interest, um, on the internet and so on. We worked with the FBI, with the, with the, uh, Texas department of public safety, their Intel folks, um, you know, it, there was a lot going on behind the scenes that I really wasn't a part of. I uh, found out after the fact more than anything. And uh, we had to, you know, we had to put together a pretty comprehensive safety plan in order to try and protect the people that were participating in this event. So correct me, I think I might have said, it was it May 23rd or May 3rd, 2015? I might have gotten my facts wrong. It was May 3rd. May 3rd. Okay, as I was. My, my apologies. So... So the day of May 3rd, you go about your business that morning, do whatever you're doing, you show up for this thing. What time does it, what time do you get there to start working this overtime detail? I, I was scheduled to work from 2 to 7, uh, 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. I arrived about 1.30 um, and looked up the lieutenant that put this safety plan together because I didn't have my, I didn't know what my assignment would be. He told me, he says, man, I got you, I got you a good spot. Um he and I have been friends a long time. We worked together on SWAT for, uh, you know, a number of years. And and he's a West Point grad. Um, so he's smarter than the average bear, to say the least. Yep. Um, but anyway, he uh, he said, yeah, I got you a good spot over here. He said, um, it's going to be pretty easy. He said, but I want somebody with a little bit, you know, with a little snap over there for sure. Because my job was, I was at the far west entrance of this facility. And my only my, my job was to um, allow only the promoter Pamela Geller and her um, her security team, the guest speaker that they brought from the Netherlands, a, a politician named Geert Wilders, mm -hmm. and his security team and a caterer to come in and out of that entrance. Everything else was supposed to be there wasn't uh, supposed to be anybody in the parking area and and uh, and no traffic coming and going. So that was the sum total of what I was expected to do. And it was a, and it was more organized. I mean, we had countdowns when the dignitaries were arriving and so on, so I could have the road cleared where they didn't have to stop. And I mean, it was very well planned out. It, that sounds maybe a little oversimplified, but in any case, uh, that that was my assignment um, over in the west entrance there of the facility. So you're there. Uh, you show up. Uh, you have other other people with you. I, I believe you had a um, a school security unarmed school security officer with you as well. Yeah, and and uh, that was the only guy that was assigned there with me. Um, good guy. Um, we still correspond and see each other on you know on an occasional basis. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, every other entrance and every other part of this facility. Um, was 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 much more heavily armed. So we probably had 60 officers there to work this event that only about 220 people were going to be at. Mm. So those those folks in the law enforcement world understand if they if somebody's requiring a, an officer at a an event that's going to ha have about 200 people, chances are the most you probably have there are two. Yep. Not 60. Yeah. And uh, just you know it's more of a presence thing. But um, but we had a ton of people there, and uh, every uniformed officer except for myself was uh, rifle trained and part of our rifle program, and they had their rifles deployed, and we had about half the SWAT team out there completely kitted out with their rifles. So there were multiple officers, and uh, every one of them had rifles at every other entrance and por portion of the venue except the West entrance where me and my security guard are hanging out. Kind of skipping ahead here a little bit, but do we think or the investigation uncover that maybe they chose your uh, point of entry where you were stationed because you had, I guess, the least amount of officers and the least amount of firepower? Is that a possibility? That's a probability in my book. Uh, I have no um, – viable evidence um, or anything that I can substantiate that with. But, you know, these guys came from Phoenix. So my thought is if you drove from Phoenix and you came up on the very first entrance because they were coming um, from the West going East, if you, the very first entrance you come to, 
would not likely be where you would just decide to mount this attack. Mm -hmm. My thoughts would be they would drive through the, the entire venue, take a look at what's going, you know, where they're trying to get to, where they're trying to go in, all those kind of things, and then make a plan. And uh, from a tactical perspective, if they drove through and, and reconned this thing, um, they're looking at multiple officers, all with rifles deployed at every other entrance, especially the main entrance, which is well off the street. Um, and uh, except for on the west entrance, and they're, it, you know, they're looking over there and they say, well, there's only one police officer and uh, that's armed, and he doesn't have a rifle. Mm -hmm. He's just armed with a pistol. And he's got a security guard there, but he doesn't have a gun. And the cop's 100 years old, so how hard could this be? You know? <laughs> right. So, uh, I, I mean, from a tactical perspective, it's probably a good choice. And I think what their plan began with was they were going to breach the perimeter where I was and go on foot to the entrance to, uh, to commit mass murder. Hmm. Just as a side note, did you have a patrol rifle available to you, or no? You just had just had your sidearm. We have a, a pretty uh, comprehensive rifle training program before you can carry a rifle here in Dalton. And they don't just issue them to just anybody. Mm -hmm. um, you got to qualify twice a year, and it's a pretty uh, tough qualification, and so on. And the school's pretty tough. I was on a motorcycle most of the time, most of that time after the. Uh, program was initiated so i couldn't carry one anyway hmm. so there wasn't any necessity for me to go through the program and when i did get to a point where i was using i was uh, working out of an unmarked traffic car i could have carried a rifle then except that i had uh, i had injured a knee and i had to end up ultimately i've had both knees replaced now but i just wasn't physically able to navigate that that training because there's so much up and down and up and down and yeah. running around and all that kind of stuff i just didn't feel physically i was able and i i was i was in the midst of a of trying to get that knee repaired and and it ultimately had to be replaced and so on so it just didn't ever work out for me to to get to be a part of the rifle program as much as i would have loved to have, but i just never got that opportunity yeah I, I don't know if you've seen this in texas but uh here in arizona uh, even in california when i worked there I started seeing motor officers on their Harleys and BMWs with uh, like folding stock ARs that are locked to the the box on the back. Have you seen that at all? Yeah, actually, um, we were riding Harley Road Kings, and uh, <clears throat> toward the end of my career, I had already gotten off motors, actually, but um, had just gotten off motors. They initiated a rifle program for the motor officers um, where they had a uh, – a special AR design with a folding stock that actually would fit in the saddlebag. Hmm. They could lock up in the saddlebag and not have to be exposed. And um, so that, that was a great thing. They've just gone away from uh, just recently gone away from the Harleys and now they're riding BMWs. I don't, I don't know if they've got any way to carry a rifle now or not. To be honest with you, I'd have to kind yeah. of pick the brain of my guys. Yeah. I've seen, I've seen a couple BMWs here, uh, and they have a sort of a, it's a real odd looking mount, but it's mounted kind of to the side. So the, uh, if you're sitting on the bike, the right side rear, and it's just sort of a skeleton frame thing that locks and has a folding stock AR. I thought it was pretty, pretty nifty looking actually. And I'm a big proponent of patrol rifles. Uh, the more officers train with and carrying them, uh, the, the, the better is my humble opinion. I'm also a big fan of the shotgun, by the way. So, so people don't, don't get it twisted. I am definitely a, uh, a big fan of the 12 gauge shotgun. So with that said, you're now set up. Are you in a uh, marked or unmarked police car? Well, actually I, I'm standing. Okay. I'm not in any of them. Uh, the car is parked behind where I'm standing. Yeah, That's kind of what I meant. So, so was it a marked unit? No, 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 no. It's a, it's a, it was a slick car. Um, and, uh, and it was virtually brand new. It was my first brand new issued to me police car. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it was a, well, it was a Chevy Caprice and it was the nicest police car. It was way too nice to be a police car. It had all kinds of fancy gadgets and remote start and all kinds of good stuff on it. It was really a nice car. I was thinking I was important at that point. Yeah. 
at some point these guys approach you what's what's the first thing you see or do you hear that that alerts you to their presence and their intentions so i'm standing in a driveway that as you pull off the street there's there's a it elevates there's grade there into the parking area and the driveway is about oh give or take 40 feet wide and uh, on top of that elevated uh, approach i have the whole driveway blocked off um, with these tall four foot cones, except for about a 10 foot opening on the left side. If you're looking out the driveway, it'd be on, on my left side. And that's where I would allow the dignitaries to come in and go out and they would, they would come in and go, uh, through the parking area. And there was kind of a long road that went down kind of a hill to the back of the, uh, of the Cowell center. And that's where they were greeted by a contingent of our SWAT team and, that's where their vehicles were parked on the arena floor down there and positioned for a, for a uh, reactive escape if we had to do that. And uh, but anyway, I'm standing in this opening on one side of the driveway. And uh, my first thing, you know, uh, first time I was alerted that something was going on was this little black car, this little Chevy Cobalt, two-door car, comes around the bend. It's kind of a curved road there on Naaman Forest Boulevard. And they come from my left to my right and uh, pull partially into that driveway and stay partially onto the street, on the street. And they pull all the way to the far end of it, hmm. away from me. So that was the first indication that something was going on. And uh, to be honest with you, when I saw that, I thought, that's really odd. Um, there's what, that's a weird place to be. Right. And I always tell them, especially when I get to present at various events, um, I always tell the audience, you know, that when that hair on the back of your neck kind of stands up or the hair on your arm tingles or whatever, uh, don't ignore that. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a gift from God is yep. what that is. That that's what keeps us alive. And, uh, it, that's just your, your, that sixth sense that's telling you something isn't right. Doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. Doesn't mean it's necessarily good either. Right. Um, but it's, it's just one of those things that, that um, I think I can't imagine that not all of us uh, have that, you know, everybody's pretty much got that, that, uh, that sixth sense thing. And I'd always tell people, man, just don't ignore that. That's don't assume that it doesn't mean anything because it probably does. Yeah, we, we say that all the time on, on the on the YouTube channel, especially. Uh, Stephanie Widener is our, our CEO, and um, she teaches a class about women's self-defense. And there's been some research done about the difference between men and women when it comes to self-defense encounters and how women tend to want to normalize things or rationalize things. You go, oh, that guy has been walking behind me for two blocks. I'm sure it's fine, you know, and ignore kind of ignore the red flags. I find that fascinating. But I, I know a lot of guys – that are exactly the same way. And if they, they sense something's wrong, they instead of doing something about it or changing what they're doing to avoid the issue, they just kind of go, ah, this should be okay. Th th you know, this will be fine uh, when it obviously isn't. And I know what you mean when you say, hey, just the way this guy parked, the way he positioned his car was out of the ordinary. And especially if you've been in law enforcement as long as you had at that point, you know something's up. I mean, almost immediately, I'm sure. When that guy, when they drove up and came to a stop, my security guard buddy uh, was behind me and to my left and I, I never saw him. He never came into my field of view, but he told me personally later. And I also testified in a, in a subsequent um, trial in, in Phoenix, actually, he testified to the fact that when he saw that car drive up now, look, he's seeing exactly the same thing I'm seeing, right? Mm -hmm. He sees that car drive up. And he said he immediately started to walk toward the car because he assumed they were going to ask directions or haven't had a question or something like that. Hmm. Absolutely oblivious to the fact that there may be danger involved in this thing. Right. Um, so when I'm looking at this, I have a whole nother perspective and that's just what you're talking about. That, um, that denial kind of thing. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't want bad things to happen. Right. So we kind of hope that they aren't, that it isn't a bad thing happening. And it almost to the point where um, we almost deceive ourselves about what we're actually 
what we're actually seeing. Yeah, and law enforcement does not have that luxury. You know, just there's no, no. there's no room or time for it. Yeah, you're right. So um, so once they pulled up there in the driveway, and I'm standing there watching, I can see the back of the car pretty clearly. I can see the the passenger side pretty clearly, driver's side not so much, but I'm a little elevated. So in any case, once they came to a stop, immediately uh, both doors opened simultaneously. And uh, like I said, I can see the passenger side a lot clearer. And all of a sudden I see the foot and leg of a guy coming out and the barrel of a rifle coming up in my direction. All right, folks, in case you missed it at the top, this is part one of two. Tune in next week for part two and stay tuned for our friend, Mr. Stephen Gutowski on the Gutowski Files. All right, gang, it is time for the Gutowski Files. Steve Gutowski, our intrepid friend over at TheReload.com is joining us to talk about the issues of the day. He is the founder of TheReload.com and the host of the Weekly Reload podcast. If you could tell from my voice, I'm suffering from some pretty bad springtime desert allergies, so I'm going to try to talk as little as possible because the more I talk right now, the more likely you are to turn this off. So I'm going to, I'm going to queue up Stephen on this week's story and let him talk. Stephen, we're going to talk this week about uh, the ATF nominee. Here's the thing. When a new, unusual name hits the news and no one knows how to say it or pronounce it properly, nobody wants to be the first one to mispronounce it. But I'm just going to go ahead and say it. <laughs> ATF nominee Steve Dettelback claimed that the Ohio elections were rigged by his opponent in the Republican Party. He was running for, I believe, attorney general. So talk to us about that. I think you got his name right. I actually think that's the correct pronunciation. Anything's possible. From, from what I've heard. So good job there. Also, I think the sometimes the raspier voice could is like it gives a nice tone for for you know podcasting for listening to. Sure. But but anyway, yes, uh, Steve Dettelback, he's President Biden's second ATF nominee after the first one uh, failed to get confirmed. Uh, his name was David Shipman, but Dettelback ran for Attorney General in Ohio in 2018. He lost the race, but during the race, he was continually using heated rhetoric to question the integrity of really all elections in Ohio. Um, he claimed that his opponent, Dave uh, Yost, who ended up winning and is currently the attorney general there, uh, was essentially, uh, well, quote, rigging the elections. Uh, here's, here's a quote from him. Uh, in 20, 2018, April 11th, he said, quote, don't let Dave, or don't let Yost distract you. He's part of this mess. Um, secret meetings, rigged elections. Uh, he went on to say uh, that the voter registration policy they have in Ohio, uh, where they remove people from the rolls if they've determined that they've moved um, and haven't voted in, in a series of elections, was, quote, insidious and tantamount to cheating. And he said, quote, it's about whether elected officials can rig the political system to get a partisan edge. And so he, you know, he he did this at least 19 different times. He wrote a, an entire op-ed claiming that Ohio's elections were rigged. He also complained about the redistricting maps in Ohio as another example of all of the elections that are being rigged. So he, he was pretty expansive in questioning the uh, integrity of, of Ohio's elections. So, with that said, um, he's obviously well documented to have said and done these things. Um, I love the gerrymandering excuse. That's always something that somebody always brings up gerrymandering uh, as if both parties aren't uh, implicit, uh, complicit in gerrymandering. But I guess my question is why is that relevant to our listeners? Why should they care the ATF nominee is questioning elections in Ohio? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I mean, the reason this matters is it's already difficult to become confirmed as an ATF nominee. There's only been one confirmed permanent ATF director since 2006 when uh, they first the Congress first passed a law to make it a Senate confirmed position. And obviously the president uh, last time around didn't get his nominee through. Is there anything that creates controversy is going to make it more difficult? For him to get to the 50 votes he needs for confirmation right. and obviously this rhetoric he's using on elections is probably sounds very similar to everyone listening uh to what former president donald trump has 
said of the 2020 election, which obviously was one of the catalysts for the Capitol riots, which a lot of basically all of the senators who are going to be voting on this nomination experienced firsthand. And so uh, there, while there is, frankly, a pretty strong partisan tendency to want to defend claims of rigged elections on, by, you know, by your own party, right. there may also be a bit of a, a personal remembrance of what happened on January 6th and sort of the worst case scenario that this sort of language can lead to. And that, that may well affect him with some of the moderate senators who really are going to be the ones that decide whether or not he becomes the next ATF director. Absolutely. And, you know, I think I like to tell people that um, this is I'm going somewhere with this. Trust me. Once um, the general populace decides they don't want to listen to the police because they don't like this or that law. So they're all going to uh, riot. They're going to run around and light things on fire. Uh, that doesn't work for society because eventually uh, the police can't possibly control everybody at one time. They're there to deal with individuals or small groups. And I'll make this analogy. Once people in power of any party, not just Republican or Democrat, once they start making accusations about the integrity of elections uh, that are specious, frankly, in most of these cases... Uh, that undermines that undermines the integrity of the election all by itself. The fact that people in power are questioning things without a lot of solid evidence. You know, there's no kraken, no kraken has been unleashed as far as I know or released uh, to this point. Uh, so I think I think you make a great point in as much as that we we need to protect against this sort of thing because if people think their vote doesn't count. There's a percentage of the population, in my opinion, that will that will dissuade them from voting, and that's not good. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, look, the, there's certainly debate over, like you mentioned earlier, re you know, congressional districting in basically every state. Uh, and you could have a different point of view about Ohio's, uh, the way that they remove registered voters from the rolls over how they decide whether or not somebody has probably moved. The, now, the Supreme Court, I will say, uh, the United States Supreme Court did uphold that Ohio uh, regulation that he was describing as insidious and, and said was tantamount to cheating. But you know, there's ways to obviously debate these issues and have different positions on them or oppose a policy without immediately going to the idea that all of the elections now in Ohio are completely fraudulent and right. can't and the the system can't be trusted at all. You know that that's that's really the issue here because you're right. I mean. And look, when people, if people really believe that the elections are being stolen and and the system is rigged and they have no influence through voting, that's how you get violence. I mean, that's exactly what happened on January 6th. A lot of those people genuinely believed that the election had been stolen. And well, what are you, what are you going to do if you genuinely believe that, right? It, you could certainly resort to violence and we've, we've seen it. And that's, and these, these lawmakers who are going to decide on uh, Dettelbach's confirmation saw it firsthand, of course, right. in that situation. So uh, now, obviously, Democrats have been very vocal about criticizing former President Trump for for making these same sorts of accusations. Uh, but of course, you know, you, like you said, there it's not it's not the first time that happened. You, Stacey Abrams, who was running for governor in in Georgia, refused to concede. She she accepted the outcome of the election, but she's refused to concede for basically the same reasons that Dettelbach cited here for calling Ohio's uh, elections rigged. So it's a, it's definitely a bipartisan issue, a uh, bipartisan problem to see this sort of rhetoric employed. But you do wonder after January 6th whether that uh, is going to be as accepted anymore on Capitol Hill. Yeah, agreed. I think it can go one of two ways, like you, like you pointed out. Someone who is under the impression that their vote, uh, that they're disenfranchised, their vote is no longer counted or no longer means anything, is either going to be sad and refuse to vote and walk off into a corner, or they're going to resort to violence to, to fix what they perceive as this injustice. And with that, before my, divo my voice degrades anymore, I'm going to encourage people to go over to the reload.com and get a membership. 
Uh, Stephen relies on your membership money to do what he's doing. Don't forget to check out the Weekly Reload podcast. It is available on all major podcasting platforms to include YouTube. And if you're a member, you get it a day early. Stephen, man, thanks so much for being here. I'll see you next week. Absolutely. Absolutely.